Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and you can email me with your thoughts or questions on live at cicerone.co.uk. This is a podcast of the highlights of our live event on cycle touring. The full video is available to watch on our YouTube channel, or you can find it if you go to cicerone.co.uk forward slash live. I chatted to three of Cicerone's cycling expert authors. Mike Wells, who is an author of both walking and cycling guides and has an incredible amount of knowledge of cycling routes, both in the UK, Europe and across the world. Mike's guidebooks include cycling the north coast of Scotland, as well as lots of cycle routes following European rivers, such as the Elbe, the Danube, the Loire and the Rhone and the Rhine cycling routes. John Hayes is a retired management consultant living in Brighton. He's done a lot of walking. He he did a 5,000 kilometer trek across Europe from Spain to Budapest. John has also written a cycling guide for Cicerone on the Ruta Via de la Plata. Finally, Carl McKeating is the co-author with Rachel Croller of several books, including Walking in the Auvergne, Outdoor Adventures with Children in the Lake District, and Cycling the Way of the Roses, the Reavers Route, and the Hadrian's Wall Cycle Route. I hope you enjoy listening to this podcast, and keep listening for our special discount code. Between you, you've done an awful lot of cycling books. Do you want to just go through, if we do Mike and then John and then Carl, and just highlight one of your favourite cycle tours that you've done? That would be that'd be great. Well, as Han- Hannah mentioned, most of my books concern long rides of two to three weeks length. Perhaps my favourite of all of those within Europe, anyway, is cycling the Loire from its source to the sea across France. France is a lovely country to cycle in anyway. The Loire gives you an opportunity to see a huge chunk of that country as you go along. And because it's a river, so rivers flow downhill. So cycling a river from the source to the sea is generally downhill with no big hills, which makes it nice. Go on, John. What's yours? Um, <laughs> well, I think um, to, I've cycled in France, I've cycled in the UK, but... I have a particular love of Spain and I've done a lot of walking in Spain. I've done uh, a couple of guidebooks, walking guidebooks in Spain. So I have to say my favourite one is the one I've just finished in terms of cycling. And that's the route to Villa to Plata. It's got everything as far as I'm concerned. It's got variety, it's off-road, on-road, and it's got the most beautiful towns to visit. And so it's a bit of a plug, but it's definitely <laughs> my favourite route. And I'd love to do it again as soon as possible. Super smooth. No one noticed that that was a plug. <laughs> um, <laughs> Carl, go on. What's your what's your favourite? I it, like the kind of professional Yorkshireman that I am. Anything that goes through Yorkshire kind of gets a positive stamp from me. Yeah, the, the way of the roses. I just think it's a fantastic ride. Really hilly. Where it, at the beginning of the ride, where you've got the energy, and and then it kind of flattens out, and it's really, very pleasant, beautiful ending. Yeah, out of all the ones we've discussed, I have actually done The Way of the Roses and it was very hilly and I loved it. It was fantastic. And I learned a ton about what not to do when you're cycle touring from doing The Way of the Roses. And I think the next cycle tour might be a Mike Wells source to see variety because I think it would be really nice to do something where (laughs) I didn't feel like I was just going to break at the end of every day. But yeah, The Way of the Roses was such a, a fantastic experience. So we had a question from Jill and she wanted to do Lon Las Cymru later this year on her e-bike. And she wants to do it by getting the train to Cardiff from her home in North Wales. And she's asking if there's any tips for travelling on a train with her bike. Well, I can talk about travelling by train with bikes. I do that a lot, but I don't know specifically about e-bikes. Although I don't think on the train there's a great deal of difference. I mean, e-bikes are a real problem if you want to fly them. In fact, you can't fly them because of the batteries. So that's a real no-no. But the trains, e-bikes are just like any other bike, except a bit heavier to lift on and off. Of course, no one charges you for taking your bike in the UK, apart from Eurostar. Most of the big companies require you to book a space. It's free, so it shouldn't be a problem. Certainly when I cycled along this Cymru, I took my bike from London to Cardiff on the Great Western. No problem. In fact, there were two of us, two bikes. 
Yeah, I think probably the best thing to do with that is to check which train operator, because each one has its different process for booking the bike. And it can be a bit of a hassle. But Richard, who did the long last book, isn't here tonight, but he always uses trains. He's he's a massive fan of public transport. So I did the Way of the Roses this year. So if you're heading up from London to do the Way of the Roses, you can suddenly find yourself with six people trying to get on the same train. And even if you booked it, sometimes it's the, the first come, first serve basis because people get there and they get their bikes on. So it's a bit of a warning, I guess. But I think we should all be campaigning against those trains to up their capacity as well. It's a real need. Yeah, I agree. I think if they're trying to encourage people to use their bike, which is a fantastic mode of transport for so many reasons, then yeah, we probably do need to figure some, you know, if you're going all the way from London up to Scotland with your bike, then there's a good chance you're going to get more than four people with bikes on, on that route. From that, have any of you had any experience with hiring bikes when you've got somewhere or are you all too particular about your particular bike to to try that? In the strangest of circumstances, my partner and I, a few years ago, we cycled a thing called the Congo Nile Trail across Rwanda from the source of the Nile to, down to the Congo River. And we, went, we thought of taking our own bikes. It was about 300 pounds a bike to take them. It was really expensive. Um, we, and I found a British-owned company, British people ran it, in Rwanda, who hired good quality bikes. That Marin, same as the bike I have here. And they let us have a couple of bikes to cycle across Rwanda on. That's the only time I've hired a bike for a sort of a big ride. Um, I, I've occasionally hired bikes like cycle around New York or other cities, but long distance no but if you do the Camino and I'm, I'm not sure it's the same uh, on the Ritz La Plata but certainly on the Camino there's a lot of bike hire companies now which will provide yeah. the bike at the beginning of the route at Saint Jean Peter Port yeah. and you can then leave it with them in uh, Santiago at the end that's become quite yeah. a big business now on the Camino yeah yeah John do you have anything to add about that no I, I, I haven't hired a bike personally but as, as Mike says the there are a number of people who number of companies who do that service and I've identified them in my own guide and so <laughs> I'm so desperately in love with my own bike I'm not sure if I wanted because uh, I feel I'd be betraying my own bike if I was to do something like that. <laughs> um, I mean I guess from the, the wonderful kind of universality of, of bikes you can kind of hire them anywhere there's so many places you know this but I mean, I've probably hired a, a couple of bikes here and there over the, over the years. My, my main advice, if you're going to hire a bike, is take your own saddle. And it's dead easy. Just take the saddle off your bike, take it with you, and put it on your hire bike. Mm-hmm. Um, the mm-hmm. saddle's the most critical part if you're cycling a long way. I usually take my pedal cleat, my SPD pedals, for using my cleated shoes as well. So the rest of it, yeah, I'll hire. But saddle and possibly pedals, take your own. That's a brilliant tip because the pain of adjusting to a new saddle is not to be sniffed at um and i think if you've got a saddle that is comfortable for you and doesn't cause any new bruises then yeah that is well worth the taking it off your bike and and yeah fab thank you um right a really quick one is there a cycle touring guide for the hebrides yes there is it's by richard barrett um it's brilliant so yeah have a look at the cicerone website and you'll get 25 percent off with the discount code that we're doing tonight which is cycling um should be nice and easy so yes if you're feeling inspired then um there's that um Can I right we just... we've got can I just do a bit? I'm not, so, I have cycled. I, have, I didn't write the book, but I have cycled around the Hebrides. It's wonderful. It's just amazing how different <laughs> all the islands are. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, <laughs> you know, just last summer, we took the kids to Jura in the Inner Hebrides, and cycling there was fantastic. There's like one road on Jura, 200 people, one road, fantastic. But you can cycle all the way to George Orwell's house and then dive into the sea and freeze, as I did it. Freezing <laughs> is that water. Right. Halfway there, there's the one hotel on the island, which is also the distillery. So I stayed in the hotel and got a free tour of the distillery thrown in when I was staying in the hotel. And, and Jura has ever since been my favourite malt whiskey. So, oh, fantastic, fantastic! Right, we we have got loads of questions coming in, so this we'll have to, uh, yeah, move on. So somebody is planning to do the route of Via de la Plata this year, so that's. Excellent. Excellent. They say they can't wait for John's book. So that's nice to know. You've sold one. Um, <laughs> um, it, what did you do for getting your bike there? And what would you recommend uh, for, for Dave and his wife? Right. Um, what I did, and it, 
it's a challenge because you're you're not starting you're finishing it at a different place to a place you start so the option of a massive bag or something like that is, is not straightforward so what i did um i got a huge plastic bag from wiggle which is the sort of cycling uk option lots and lots of bubble wrap took the back wheel i've got disc brakes and put, took the back wheel off covered up the derailleur turned the handlebars around took the pedals off etc 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 and then put it in the bag and turned up at the airport. I've done done that six or seven times. And to be honest, every time you turn up at the airport, you get a different response uh, because it's never the same people as you put it through the x-ray machine. And you just have to really be quite tough to get it through sometimes, a bit, a bit of sort of confidence. I've never not been able to get it through. The worst experience I had was when I came back from one of my trips on the route of the Village Plateau and I came back via Oviedo and I came back by a Spanish airline and they said, we just don't take bikes on the plane. And they said, I gave them all sorts of bluff. And they, in the end, they put it through one of those wrapping machines and that worked incredibly well, apart from the fact that it consumed about 100 metres of plastic, which was a bit of a, a, a pain, but it was effectively as, as strong as a bike box. I've looked at it since, and you can get a bike box, uh, you can buy bike boxes, cardboard bike boxes. There are specialist companies who will uh, send your bike out to one address and pick it up from another address from the UK. I've never used them, but I've been in touch with them, I've talked to them, and I would like to try one of those, actually, because they, they look pretty professional, but I, I've never actually used them. The bike boxes look okay. You, you need to know your bike a little bit, I think, because one of the things I did discover on one of my trips is that I, I did bend, uh, I, I snapped the derailleur hanger off, which I, I, I learned from, and uh, I'd never do that again, or I'd dismantle the derailleur. But it is, it, uh, Mike might have some other contributions on this, but it is one of the issues of traveling on a plane with a bike. Um, you can do it. I've never failed in being able to get my bike to somewhere, but it's always an adventure. Yeah, I can give you quite a lot of extra advice, really. Um, Spain is one. Spain is a very difficult country for bicycles because the trains, long distance trains, don't take bicycles, which makes getting around Spain, if you're doing the Camino or the Ritalab Plata, very difficult. But if you fly in with your bike, uh, most most UK airports have a branch of, I think it's left luggage company, and they will sell you a box at the airport. You can then pack your bike at the airport in a cardboard bike box, which you then just discard at the other end. Quite a few airports, I mean, Basel, for instance, you leave it there. They then come and collect it and take it around to the departures area so that any incoming cyclist gets a free bike box. It's very nice of the Swiss. But coming back from Santiago in Spain, after you've done the Ruta de la Plata, there are, there's the post office. That's the main one. For 90 euros, they will fly your bike in a, in a box. They'll pack it for you, fly it, and deliver it to you at home for 90 euros, which is a bargain, actually, considering it costs you 25, 30 pounds for a box itself if you buy one. It costs you a taxi ride to the airport with your bike in it, in the box. And it costs you a flight fare, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds, maybe Ryanair, 60 pounds. So 90, 90 euros to deliver your bike home in pristine condition is the bargain. So anyone does the Camino or the Ruta de la Plata, go to the post office. There's a branch in the Pilgrim Centre in the centre of Santiago that specifically wraps your bike up and sends it home for you. What you can do in Spain, actually, um, the buses take bikes, believe it or not. Underneath is a big, in the, in, the, in the luggage compartment underneath. And the biggest bus company, Alsa, um, they like it to be in a bag, but most of the other bus companies uh, don't mind. You just need to be careful and protect your bike, obviously, because it's in the bottom of the bus. But they will happily take bikes on the buses. Yeah, and that's a good way. That's a good way home from Spain too. Put your bike under under the bus, take it to Bilbao, and get a ferry from there. Okay, um, navigation. What's the best way for navigating, and what maps do you prefer? Carl, do you want to kick us off with this one? I do have, I guess, a techie tip just on this something I will do. So say I did the Yorkshire Dale Cycleway, which is extraordinarily hilly. I did that in a day uh, a few months back and it was amazing. Really, really good ride. But anyway, what I did before doing the ride, but the bits I was unsure of or unclear of, I kind of had a look on Google Maps and Google Earth and so much of, if you're road cycling, certainly it's on the internet now. So if you think, okay, well, that part of the route is straightforward, but I'm unsure about how I'm going to get through this city or get through this place, or can I go wrong there? Sometimes if you've got a good memory for these things, a bit of prior visual research can help you. But it, it depends how your brain works, really. We've also, we do GPX files for a, a lot of the routes, which if you can figure out the complexity in getting them onto your chosen device, which can be a bit of a nightmare, but if you can figure that out, that's really helpful. 
if you need help with those, there's some information on the website and on our website, but they can also be really helpful for navigation. What about European and further afield? What about maps for those places? I mean, OpenStreetMap is perhaps the main thing I use when planning. Um, I will then take the route off that, download it into a a GPX or KML track in my case, which I can then plot on a map. I don't actually take a GPS with me. I actually use that initially, then print it out onto a map so I can actually follow a paper map, which I have mounted on my bar back. But most European trails, not just the ones I've written about, but most long distance trails, there is someone somewhere who's produced a GPS route for it. If you go online, whichever route you're following, I mean, you might be following the Iron Curtain Trail, for instance, that follows the route of the Iron Curtain across Europe, or cycling any of the the French Velo routes or the Swiss Radweg network. You'll find somewhere online that someone has produced a detailed GPS track to it you can actually download. They all exist, not just the ones we produce. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Personally, I, 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 I'm a bit of a techie sort of person. I have a phone plugged to my bike and I'm following it as I go along. I don't think the challenge of navigation when you're cycling it is not so great as when you're walking, actually, because you, know, you tend to be in less remote places and the trails are, be- are better defined. But a frustration can be is when you arrive somewhere, so you, particularly if it's been a long day and you've, you've got to find a particular place when you arrive somewhere, whether it's a, a hotel or a hostel or whatever it is. So it's, I think working out before you get to a town what where the place is precisely and having that in your hand, because there's particularly if you're with some, somebody else and you're supposed to be navigating, there's nothing worse than turning up somewhere and saying, I don't know where it is or going wrong or roaming around a, a city. So um, that's the biggest navigation challenge for me is, is leaving a place and arriving at a place. Yeah. And the end of the day is not the time oh, to be adding God. on extra miles. You need to just be <laughs> straight there. <laughs> I usually produce my own city centre map if I'm going to a city or off open street map and I will blow it up to about 1 to 25. So it's really detailed. And then just use that at the end of the day. I identify where I'm going. I'll mark that on the map before I go. And that does help. Yeah, great. Someone is asking as well about touring kit. What would you recommend with, with finding kit? This. Well, I guess the starting point is how you carry what you're carrying. I mean, the pan, the panniers you need, and that really depends on how long you're going for. Two to three week ride, you need to be very careful about what you pack because you, know, you can't take four or five of everything. And the policy I use is I take one to wear, one to wash, and I take a tube of washing detergent. And each night, or every other night perhaps, we'll wash things. So one to wear, one to wash. And then if it's still wet in the morning, you just clip it on the back with a safety pin or a clothes peg or something, and it dries as you go along. So that's for clothing. But the pannier themselves, of course, are very important. If you are camping or cooking as you go along, then you probably need both a front and back set of panniers. I just use back panniers because I always stay in hotels, guest houses, you know, refuges, whatever. But if you're going for two or three weeks camping, you're going to need both back and front panniers and maybe even the box on the back on your, on your carrier as well. I, I, I came from the walking light movement because I walked, spent six months walking across Europe. So everything has to be light. And I think the same, the same applies to cycling as well. It's a lot easier if you don't have to pedal up a hill with a great load on, on the bike. And initially I went with panniers. Like Mike, I tend to stay in hotels or, or sleep in a bed at night. But I quite like the sort of new gravel bike, large saddlebag type approach and the things which stick out the back. I think they're quite neat and stylish. And I've really got into those. And they're I think about 15 to 20 litres in terms of size. And, and if you adopt the approach Mike does, um, only take two bits of kits and perhaps a, a, a lightweight pair of trousers or shorts for walking around town in the evening. That's more than enough. Definitely. Saddlebags are amazing. If you're staying places at night, coming from a mountaineering point of view, I would say light is right. Personally, unless it was really going to be a horrendously long journey or it's going to be particularly hard weather conditions, I would always look to take less kit. I wouldn't personally be looking at front panniers. I'd just use back ones. But I would say don't skimp on the actual panniers because cheap panniers really do drop to bits and and they tend to be invariably not waterproof. So whereas there's various companies will do bits and bats of kit that are cheap, affordable and good, um, panniers, you can get some really, really rubbish stuff that's cheap. And just is, you know, it, the old, you get what you pay for. It really is true. Hmm. I have a top tip about buying this stuff. So the advice that you get from people who work in these shops, the, the small bike shops, you know, these people are not there because they're making millions out of working in these shops. 
they're there because they they love being around the the outdoors or the bikes or, or whatever so I think if you can find a, a friendly bike shop they will just be so so valuable and they will help you far more than just selling you the stuff they'll give you tons of free extra advice um, so yeah just a bit of a, a shout out there to independent shops or shops in general and not just buying things online I guess definitely can I just chuck two things in a do and a don't um the do first even though I have very good quality panniers which are fully waterproof I still pack everything inside in a big plastic rubble bag from a builder's merchant I mean they're only about 50 peach and they'll completely double line your bag for you and the don't don't think you can get away with long distance cycling wearing a rucksack your center of gravity is far too high it's dangerous not to be recommended and you won't like it yeah, I, I will echo that. I got severe. I cycled to London with a heavy rucksack in. Had James Joyce's Ulysses in the back because you need to carry that on the cycling. Um, I was young. I got a horrendous neck ache. Absolutely destroyed my neck. I didn't know any better. No, no. Panniers are the way forward, definitely. Yeah. Has anybody done any camping on these long distance cycle tours? Yes, it's good fun, but uh, I think that advice about lining the panniers, that, that really holds true. That's such a good tip, especially like if you're camping, if you don't do anything else, at least bag your sleeping bag. Make sure that stays dry because the last thing on earth you want is a wet sleeping bag. Uh, no, like like Mike, I, 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 I prefer to sleep in a bed at night. And, and indeed, one of the big advantages, I think, of, of cycling is because basically you can cover big distances in a day. And so... On the route of it at a plateau, you, you can stay in really nice, interesting destinations at the end of every single day. And uh, big choice of places to stay, cheap, medium, expensive if you want. So um, you definitely, unless you really like it, you don't need to camp. Well, there are two reasons you might want to camp. One is it's a lot cheaper in most cases. Uh, and two, yes, if you like camping, if that's part of your holiday is camping, then go that way. If you go to Spain, I mean, the Ruta de la Plata, slightly lesser, but the Camino, there are so many pilgrim refuges, which are actually cheaper than campsites quite often. And wild camping is often illegal anyway, so you find yourself having to use campsites. But no one takes camping equipment on the Camino, and I don't think anyone does. I never met anyone I did the Ruta de la Plata taking camping equipment there either. Yeah, I like to stay in a bed at night. I mean, there are lots of people who, for money reasons more than anything else, do need to camp sometimes. If you'd like a 25% discount on any of Cicerone's cycling guidebooks, please use the code cycling at cicerone.co.uk. This will include all of the guidebooks we've discussed tonight, as well as all of Cicerone's mountain biking, sportive cycling and other cycling guidebooks. I think some of the routes that you've done, Carl, are really good for beginners because actually there's so many things you don't have to worry about if you're doing a three-day tour. You know, the Way of the Roses that I did, it goes from Morecambe, which is down the road from me, and it goes across the country to Bridlington. And there are a few hills, but actually overall it wasn't too hilly. There were loads of bike shops on the way if anything fell off. There was loads of accommodation options. Everyone was really helpful with putting the bike somewhere safe at night time. And to be honest, if I'd have got to York and I'd have just had enough, I could have just got the train home from York. So I think probably between everybody here, you just want people to try something that was suitable for them. They might not be ready to go and do something enormous, but maybe just do a weekend trip. But then some of Mike's routes, they aren't so challenging in, in that way either. Yeah, but you've got to get there, though. It's but you have got to get, there. to get there. Yeah, yeah. In terms of an international comparison, I think uh, Mike would probably concur that cycling in France is particularly well organised, long distance cycling in France. So it's well signposted, there's great information online. My first trips abroad on long distance routes were to France, get ferries to various places uh, in, in Brittany, all, all over the place. So it's a great place you can ferry in and you can ferry out. Um, Spain is not quite so friendly, but I personally, I think it's a lot more interesting than France. Um, it's slightly more challenging, different off-road routes and things like that. But France is definitely a good place to as, as an international introduction to long distance cycling. Yeah, there's two networks, really. You've got the Eurovelo network, which is trans-European, but crosses France in a number of different directions. But then you have the Voie Vert, the French's own Voie Vert network, which is growing all the time. And just because the French are putting down asphalt cycle routes along old railway lines at a rate of knots that you wouldn't believe. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, congratulations, Jerry, for getting into cycle touring at 70. He's asking 
if there's any general advice about buying touring bikes as opposed to racing and mountain bikes. Carl, do you have anything to say about that? Um, yeah, get a bike that's light, relative, you know, comfortable. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan and I've always been a big fan of getting stuff secondhand, really cheap. But in terms of bicycles, if you do do that and you're not kind of particularly mechanically minded, if you do get a cheap secondhand bike, know what you're buying get it to a bike shop get it let it have let them have a once over of it get it mechanically working and, and well checked out but you can you can find out if you are buying a second hand bike have a look at the brands find what sort of bicycle it is and google it go do some reviews and and compare that's a good way of saving money um should you be so inclined well i'm completely the opposite i've never bought a second hand bike um, I always buy the best bike I can afford. I will splash out to get a really good bike. I like it to be light, so aluminium frame, as much carbon fiber forks in particular at the front. Definitely disc brakes. I would not consider a bike without disc brakes these days. They are the most wonderful invention recently in cycling. So I, I will spend as much as you can afford on getting a good bike. When you go to the bike shop, though, take it out for a test ride. Don't just buy it off the peg and go and try it out, not just up and down the road, but go and try and ride across a field or something on it if they'll let you. Make sure it fits you exactly in what you want and make them adjust it for you too. I mean, if you're short, you can get shorter cranks than the ones that come with it. If you ask if it's an expensive bike, they'll change them for you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Right. We've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to try and get through a few more really quickly. We've got a tip from someone called Joe. He's saying that sometimes it's better to buy a bike when you get to the destination if you do a bit of what Mike was saying and take your racks and panniers and tools with you. That's quite an interesting thing to have a go at. Uh, Fee has asked when it's a good month to cycle in the Hebrides. Uh, Fee, you need to get the book. Um, but the best time to go touring... if in the friendliest possible way um the best time to go to the hebrides is between april and october just because the days are longer and the weather is at its best but i mean it is still the hebrides so it's still likely to be wet and blustery no doubt at some point there's one other thing too i've done it in june i've done it in august and in august you get midges yeah we i mean we could have a whole live event about midges <laughs> it's all about midges if you're camping don't go in august i think that's definitely spot on advice yeah yeah you just have to try and cycle past them just keep going faster and faster it's when no it's when yes when you stop they get you when you're going fast you're fine but the minute you stop they catch, yeah. they catch up with you and they punish you for going too fast yeah, they're like heat-seeking missiles that just <laughs> chase after you. <laughs> um, okay, what is your uh, favourite piece of kit, Carl? Oh, crikey. Um, saddlebag, I really, that was mentioned earlier, those are brilliant, absolutely superb. Because your streamline, it's it's more aerodynamic and you can get quite a lot in them. So, yeah, that's my favourite piece of kit, actually. On uh, I have a, a really nice road bike that I got second-hand but it had been used twice by someone who, referring back to the other advice, hadn't really checked it out and they didn't get on with it. But yeah, saddlebags, absolutely fantastic. Okay, Mike, what is a surprising piece of kit that you would leave at home? Oh, gosh. What I wouldn't take with me? Yeah, something that you thought was necessary, but actually over the years you've decided, no, it's not. It's a waste of space and weight. Hmm. Yes, T-shirts for the evenings, I think. Um <laughs> I, I, I have cycling shirts for the day too. Well, I have three actually because I have two short sleeve ones and a long sleeve one. Or if it's a different time of year, maybe two long sleeve and a short sleeve. Um, and I have a shirt to wear in the evenings when I go out for dinner, a uh, you know, proper shirt with a collar. But I take t-shirts and I find I never wear them. There's never an occasion to wear them. I'm not wearing them when I'm cycling and I'm not wearing them in the evenings. So I stop taking them. Yes, good point. Carl, how much cycle maintenance would you suggest people knew before they set off? Ah. Uh... You see that yeah that's that's like kind of going to a bike shop but ultimately make sure if you haven't done much cycle touring before the one thing that you really need to be able to make sure you can do is change a flat tire i've come across people who just the, who were on cycle tours and they have got a flat tire they haven't got anything to any wherewithal of how to change it or how to remove the tire and, and what to do in the end of helping them um, so that would be the bare minimum. But I mean, there's a limit to what you can learn. But like with everything these days, there's always, if you want to gen up, there's always those how-to videos on YouTube. And, you know, if you can be bothered learning that stuff, then great. It, I mean, it depends what you're doing. I mean, I remember being in Tibet and some dudes who cycled there from Holland and they'd gone over the Karakoram. And yeah, I think if I was doing something like that, 
I'd want to know how, how to fix as much as I could. But um, yeah, yeah, I just you just crack on. But definitely know how know how to change an inner tube. Yeah, and how to repair an inner tube, perhaps. And and a couple of points on that actually in in your guidebooks respectively you will make a point of mentioning where there are bike shops that type of thing so that sort of information is usually in a guidebook and you can make use of those and also there are a couple of articles on our Cicerone website in the Cicerone Extra section about how to how to set up your bike so it fits you properly there's a whole one from Richard about panniers and frame packs and he really geeked out on all the options there and he's provided photos and, and that type of thing. So yeah, there's plenty of places that you can get information for those. Um, Mike, is it okay not to wear Lycra if you don't want to? <laughs> um, I don't think I've got any Lycra. Uh, I have some very nice uh, cycling shirts and then, and they're just plain blue, in fact, all, all three of them, um, short sleeve ones, long sleeve ones. Um, they're exactly the same, so no one can tell that I've actually got a different one on the next day. And when you look at my books, you'll see how my partner often seems to be wearing the same thing. No, she's not. She's just wearing an identical thing that was clean the next day. But, uh... Yeah, I, I, when I was doing quite a bit of cycle training a couple of years ago, I got a really inconvenient sunburn where my trousers had slightly fallen down a bit as I was riding. And it was really uncomfortable. And I, in that moment, learned why you see people wearing these ridiculous uh, lycra outfits. And and then I became a person that got one because that sunburn was not worth it. So, yeah, there's there's probably other reasons, but I think you have to wear what you're comfortable in. That's the most important thing, I'm, I'm sure. And things that dry very quickly when they get wet. I mean, it doesn't matter if your clothes, if they dry on you in half an hour, that's not a problem. Yeah, I mean, you probably always stink by the time you get to the end, do you? <laughs> Whatever you take. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah, quite. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think, or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Please email live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes, or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, but in the meantime, please join us on our social channels. We're on all the main ones as at Cicerone Press, and we also have a Facebook group, Cicerone Connect, where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.